short announcement. Are you ready? Interpreters? Hmm? Uh, short announcement. Well, um, unfortunately, I cut the lunch break uh, a bit unnecessary because we won't have um, Jan on a video bridge. Oh. But, but, uh, be because Jan is a very strict person, uh, he also managed to have his presentation recorded on video. Uh, and it arrived as a backup option, so we're going to have the backup option, and we're going to see a uh, something about a very important topic, and it's the electrification of the heating sector, which is one of the future tendencies. The whole afternoon block is basically um, focused on tendencies in the future of heating. Uh, electrification is an important tendency, um, although we have, in the, even in, in Zazimiata, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, disputes on uh, what is possible, um, what is feasible, feasible uh, what are the best options. So uh, probably at the end we're going to land in a mix of solutions, and this mix of solutions is going to be also different for the different countries and regions. Uh, but it's certainly um, the electrification um, as as probably the, the best future tendency and something that um, is considered uh, for the um, best scenario for the decarbonization of the, of the sector through the use of renewable uh, electricity is one of the main things that um, is being pushed through the decarbonization scenarios nowadays. Um, we solved a few more technical things in the meantime. We have the opportunity to distance and we can control presentations with through remote control. So we can begin with Jan's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Jan Rosenau, and I'm going to talk to you today via a video. Uh, I'm in the United States this week uh, at a staff retreat, where amongst other topics, we're going to discuss our strategy on heat electrification. Uh, I would love to be in Sofia today and participate in your conference, uh, but hopefully I can participate uh, at a future event that will happen in Bulgaria on this topic. In my presentation today, I'm going to talk about heat electrification and key principles and policies that can help accelerate heat electrification in such a way that it benefits the power system that benefits decarbonization and air quality. Um, I'm going to draw largely on a report that is forthcoming that the regulatory assistance project where I work will publish later this month. And many of the ideas in my presentation will be explained in much more detail in the report. And I encourage you to read the report when it gets published later in the month. Um, I should also disclose that I'm not just a policy analyst when it comes to this topic, but I'm also a policy consumer. This is my house in Oxford, a very old Victorian terrace house, which I have uh, renovated over the years. And we have, in addition to installing several energy efficiency measures, also recently installed a heat pump. And this heat pump provides all of our hot water and our space heating needs. We don't have any gas, any heating oil, or any coal. Um, so our home is completely electrified. I'm going to come back to this and use it as an example later on in my presentation. What I want to cover today in the 15 minutes which I have is to touch on four issues. The first issue is that I want to briefly outline why heat is such an important topic when I think heat is critical to decarbonization in Europe. The second issue is that I want to briefly touch on the context in which we have this discussion and what the different options are for heat decarbonization. Thirdly, I will outline the four key principles that we've identified in our report. And finally, I will um, you know, just explain how the policy logic um, can operate, what policies are needed to actually make all this happen and accelerate heat electrification. So let me start with the first of those issues, which is um, you know, why do we care about heating so much? The main reason is that almost half of all energy use in the EU is for heat. A lot of that is for space heating and process heating and hot water heating. Most of that in buildings. This is data from the Heat Roadmap Europe, which shows very clearly the importance of heat. So a lot of heat 
is being used, a lot of energy is being used for that. And a lot of that energy is currently coming from fossil fuels. So this slide here shows you where the heat is actually coming from. And you can see that a lot of gas, oil, and coal is providing our heat. And even in district heating and electricity, a lot of that energy is coming from fossil fuels. So highly carbon intensive sector. And without addressing that, it's inconceivable how we would ever meet a net zero carbon target as outlined by the European Commission just last week in their climate law. Uh, so heat is critical to meeting Europe's climate targets. Um, that will also be the case in any of the member states um, and also in Bulgaria, of course. So heat is really important. Buildings are by far the most important sector when we look at where the heat is being used and residential buildings in particular. So buildings need to be decarbonized um, if we want to decarbonize heat. What is the context in which we have this discussion? The first important learning is that there are limited options for heat decarbonization that really can work at scale. There are many technologies around, but that those that can really decarbonize heat at scale are fairly limited. The first option, and that is what I will focus on in my presentation today, is electrification using heat pumps. The other option that is often discussed is district heat. District heat can use waste heat and heat from any source. Um, I will, I will um, explain you know, later on that heat electrification can also use district heating and store heat in district heating networks, which is very beneficial. But largely, you know, heat electrification through district heating will also have to happen through electrification, in my view. Biomethane, biogas, which you can see here in the um, bottom right corner, can only provide a relatively small um, amount of heat. The last studies I've looked at all agree that it's probably going to be less than 10%. So it's not a bulk solution. And we may need, need to use that uh, biomethane and biogas um, for other sectors which are harder to decarbonize. You may think of some industrial applications and even transport. Hydrogen, which is currently being hyped in the discussion in Europe, is a very important way of generating a high premium fuel that we can use to decarbonize industry sector applications and maybe some parts of transport. It could also play an important role in seasonal balancing and in dealing with peaks. However, I don't see hydrogen as a key option for heat decarbonization simply for the reason that it's so much more inefficient than using heat pumps, but a factor of five or six, depending on what, what studies you're looking at Climate Change Committee in the UK suggests about a factor of five, and an Agora in an event study um, suggested a factor of about six in terms of how much more electricity we would need if we use hydrogen opposed to using heat pumps. So limited options for heat decarbonization, electrification clearly is a key option in here. It is also quite a wicked problem. Um, you know, if we look at this picture, you see there's so many different building types and they're all owned by different people. So we have to persuade an awful lot of people in very different buildings to make decisions that are all aligned in some way. So it's a very wicked problem in that we have to deal with multiple actors, multiple building types, and many locations. One issue that people often um, highlight is that electrification of heat may simply completely um, you know, overwhelm the grid. And we would have significant problems with peaking issues. You know, people would use heat when there's already a peak on the system, and that would just exacerbate the problem. I will come back to this later in my presentation, but this is a key argument that some people use against heat electrification. And I will come back to that, especially when I now talk about the principles. So there are four principles I want to share with you. There are many more, but those are the four key ones that we looked at in the context of this report. The first, the first principle is to put energy efficiency first. Why is that such an important principle? There's two reasons uh, for that. Reason number one is that it reduces the total cost of heat decarbonization significantly. Uh, pretty much any studies, whether that's from the IEA or studies from the Wuppertal Institute recently, um, they all show that without energy efficiency, heat decarbonization is going to be a lot more expensive. 
So that's a key ingredient in any heat decarbonization strategy, whether that's hydrogen or electrification, um, you know, energy efficiency should always play a major role. Second, energy efficiency provides thermal storage capabilities of buildings. So buildings can actually store thermal energy for quite long periods of time if they're energy efficient. And this uh, data here from a recent study by Tado, uh, a smart thermostat company from Germany, shows how long buildings can keep heat inside uh, when it's really cold outside, zero degrees centigrade and 20 degrees centigrade inside. You can see the heat loss varies quite significantly across Europe, particularly the UK, where I live, uh, stands out as the worst performing country in this study. And that is because the buildings in the UK are extremely inefficient in many places. So heat loss can be decreased by having more efficient buildings, which in turn means we can store energy for longer periods of time. And I will now explain you know, why that is an important feature um, of efficient buildings. So shifting heat load, is electric heat load, is critical if you want to avoid adding to the peaks. The blue line here shows a typical load curve that we can see in many countries in Europe. You have a morning peak and then maybe a higher evening peak when people come home from work. And if we add heat demand on top of that, that those peaks will um, go up. However, if we can shift heat load into periods of lower demand, and especially when we have more renewables on the system, this will have significant system benefits. Um, and you know, looking at studies that have looked at the storage capabilities in buildings recently, we can see that several hours of heat can be stored thermally in buildings without a significant loss in comfort if those buildings are energy efficient. The other important benefit of doing that is that there are significant emission effects. So if we shift load into the low demand periods, we can actually um, reduce emissions because energy consumption during peak hours is associated with very high carbon emissions. Outside of peak hours, carbon emissions are lower. This slide shows you the um, hourly um, emissions in the UK per kilowatt hour of electricity generated, and you can see how much it varies um, over the course of the day. And the fourth principle is to economically incentivize load shifting by designing tariffs to reward flexibility. So um, you know, Dong Energy has actually tried this in 2011, 2012 in Denmark. So they had a fleet of homes with heat pumps where they have automated the operation of the heat pump, aligned that with a tariff that was flexible, higher during peak hours and lower outside of peak hours. And they have shown that customers were actually quite happy to have their heat pumps being automated in that way, as long as they could see a financial benefit, um, they, they would be willing to um, buy into that model. And I have just tested this myself, by the way, with my own heat pump. So I'm on a very special tariff. This is the blue line here, it's a typical day. This is the tariff I'm paying, and it's the Octopus Agile tariff. Every half an hour, that tariff changes. Um, you can see here during the peak hours, it's very, very high. You can also see in red my energy consumption. That's for the entire house, not just the heat pump, by the way. And you can see that during peak hours, when the tariffs are very high, consumption is very low. And I do this by simply scheduling the heat pump in a way that avoids consuming electricity during peak hours by essentially preheating the building and then accepting a very small loss in comfort over those periods when the tariffs are very high and it switches back on again. So this works pretty well, and I've done this now for several months, and um, it's, it's a fairly consistent picture. So those are the key principles. Um, I now briefly talk about the policies that will be needed. So how do we actually get heat electrification done? There are four steps. The first one is to reduce heat demand through energy efficiency policy. This can be done by building codes, applying standards and labeling to, to simply um, you know, improve the energy efficiency of the buildings themselves, and to also ensure that really inefficient buildings um, are no longer uh, you know, as part of the building stock and are phased out over time. And the same is the case for heating systems. We also need financial support schemes, energy efficiency obligations, which provide subsidy to enable people to make this happen. The second step is to reduce the carbon intensity of the energy carrier. So this is to reduce the carbon intensity of electricity when we look at heat electrification, um, but also to reduce the carbon intensity of gas um, and that could be done through carbon intensity standards, 
um, which apply to those that supply fuels being used for heating. The third step is to deploy low carbon heat technologies. This can be done again by regulation, but also by having financial support schemes in place. A very good example of that is Poland, where right now the least efficient boilers can no longer be used, and in the next few years that will be enforced. But the government is also putting in place significant subsidy, which allows people to make those changes and invest in new heating equipment. And the final step is to operate electric heating systems flexibly. And this can be encouraged through electricity pricing, will require some automation through technology, but electricity pricing I see here as a main driver of that, um, that so it can benefit people economically. Let me draw some conclusions um, of my presentation. So first, decarbonizing heat is critical for meeting our climate and clean air goals. That's, that's pretty clear. Uh, and the figures spoke for themselves from Heat Roadmap Europe. Electrification is a central pillar. Doing and heat decarbonization with hydrogen is going to take a lot longer, will be a lot harder and a lot more costly, and we need a lot more electricity for that. Energy efficiency is key to minimize the costs and build in thermal storage. Uh, and I explained the benefits of load shifting um, you know, a few minutes ago. The flexible operation of heat pumps is possible, and it can be incentivized through tariffs. So if we have dynamic tariffs, we can actually incentivize people to load shift, and they can see a financial gain. And we need a whole range of policy instruments to make this happen. It won't just happen by, it, by itself. We need regulation, we will need financial support schemes, and we also need um, you know, carbon intensity standards to drive down the carbon intensity of the electricity that we use in electric heating systems. So doing all of that will lead eventually, I believe, um, to the decarbonized heating system in Europe and beyond. I wish you um, a great conference. You can get in touch with me if you wish. My contact details are on this slide. You can also follow me on social media. I'm very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. And please read the report when it gets published. I hope the organizers can share that with you so you have something that you can read um, about our work. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a great conference. Goodbye. Тенденцията е далеч по-обещаваща, отколкото много от нас а, си дават сметка в, в този регион, но наистина Manage consumption in peak times is uh, what could support such systems. The next presentation, uh, Rene Briel, one more time, will tell us about the phase out of um, natural gas, which is a solution um, implemented in the Netherlands. We say this. Uh, we have this uh, phrase in Bulgaria, it's intranslatable. I tell you something daughter, but uh, daughter-in-law should think about it. Um, <clears throat> using of uh, fuel fossils in the long term will not be as easy as um, it was so far. We are now in a situation when the gasification of households is a more and more prevalent trend, and it's uh, very uh, highly promoted on political level. Uh, gas is still a transit fuel, um, as much as we have of it, which is not that much, and we should be very careful when promoting this option. Rene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gennady. You made some to, some kind of joke, but uh, yeah, it's in, it's intranslatable. But <laughs> um, thank you here at this conference about the. Uh, out of fossil gas, and I'm I do re keep repeating fossil gas. It's not natural gas because there's some kind of a positive connotation, but in the end, 
for, uh, gas is uh, is also uh, is causing a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So natural gas may not be the right term. So that's why I use fossil gas. So um, it is in the Netherlands. There's a process that is implemented while it's still being learned on how to do it. So we're stumbling along, I would say. But this is my presentation, starting with a bit on the context, then uh, explaining a bit more on what was in 2013, the Dutch Climate Agreement, sorry, the Dutch Energy Agreement. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, a climate agreement uh, with goals until 2020, until 2030 was agreed upon. And then I'll go and uh, say a bit more about what the role of municipalities here are, what the risks are, and what we were learning uh, on that now. So in the Netherlands, in the 1950s, very large gas fields were uh, discovered in the Netherlands, which led to a very uh, quick uh, connection to the gas grid of 95% of, uh, of buildings, plus a, uh, a very energy intensive industry. Energy intensive industry were uh, attracted to the Netherlands with very low um, gas uh, prices. So um, there, so 95% of all buildings is, uh, is connected to the gas grid. That's about 7 million uh, buildings in the Netherlands. And, uh, but what's happening now, since a couple of years, no, it's probably longer, 10 years, there are earthquakes in the region of the gas exploration in the north. So earthquakes, not some, no casualties so far, but a lot of buildings are being demolished, as you see on the there, and uh, it's worse there. So it's, there was more and more aversion against the gas exploration. And in 2018, the government decided to stop um, the gas exploration of those major fields in the Netherlands. Uh, they will phase out in a couple of years, but already since 2018, the Netherlands is a net importer of gas. So, um, yeah, which is a big change because until then it was always a net exporter. And the government said also that by 2050, all buildings will have to be disconnected from the, the gas grid. So that's, uh, that's uh, 7 million uh, buildings. So then a bit about the building stock, because I think that's important. 60% uh, of the buildings is owner-occupied, 40% is rental, of which 75% uh, of their rental is uh, social housing. So you have social housing companies that are very important, uh, which you'll hear later on. <coughs> we have a lot of row houses and, uh, and apartments, a lot of similar buildings, except for the older ones, and only 23% are detached houses. And also the majority of homes were built after World War II. And you could say that from um, everything built until 1975, so that's still more than half of the building stock, is by definition inefficient. And from 75 on, they started uh, developing some um, building codes. And for the houses from 95 on are, are better, but still. And there's a 10% of people are in energy poverty, more or less. Um, so and then, if you're talking, the political situation is also relevant for this. There's a very long tradition in the Netherlands of consensus-seeking policies, which is necessary also because there are a multitude of parties in Parliament. At the moment, we have 13 different parties in Parliament, um, but it was a few months ago, and it might be they also have a habit of splitting all the time. So there's, you always have coalition governments. Now we have a four-party coalition, and the next one will probably be five, be five or even more, because there's also a tendency of the population to vote for more extreme left or right, and the, the middle that was always the basis is disappearing. Um, but a major, big majority of people uh, support strong climate policies, and at the same time, the Netherlands is great in developing plans, climate plans, and being ambitious in wording, but we're terribly lagging behind on implementation of policies. There is no way that the Netherlands can achieve the 2020 target on renewable energy. It's just not going to happen. Um, and actually, the, I don't know if you heard about the Urgenda court case. That was, uh, by the end of 2020, the Netherlands, because of the court case, has to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25%. And I don't think it's going to work until they 
unless they co uh, close four out of five remaining coal power plants, which is <coughs> unlikely that it will happen. So, yeah, great in talking, but less good in implementation. So keep that in mind when you hear about all these great plans that reality may be a bit different. So already in 2013, uh, a first energy agreement was, uh, was reached. Um, and the reason for that was climate policy was considered very controversial across all these myriad of political parties. And it resulted in a long tradition of stop and go policies in the Netherlands. And it basically killed our wind turbine industry and it killed more uh, renewable industries. So there was uh, the process for uh, agreeing on an energy agreement uh, was developed with stakeholders in society, so labor unions, but also um, uh, companies, but also in social and environmental actors were involved and they agreed on these targets. I put a plus where the target is uh, being achieved and a minus where it's not being achieved. So you see it's a bit of a mixed bag, but it is already so much better than it was before. So that was the start. And then in 2018, we had a, oh, by the way, this guy, which you see there, he is the key guy. He is monitor, he is, he was uh, the leader of one of the parties, very highly respected. He's leading the process of monitoring of this program, this agreement, and he's also leading, he was leading the negotiations on the next, the climate agreement, and, and also leads at, at Naples, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> so in 2018, a new coalition government, four parties started, and because this energy agreement only lasted until 2020, they said we need to have a new one until 2030 because it works well. The government set a uh, CO2 emission goal for that agreement, 49% by 2030 compared to 2020, and if other EU countries or the majority of EU countries would join 55%. So um, then they said that they divided the target over the sectors. I'll tell a bit more about build environment based on the cost effectiveness. And then they started, the whole circus started again with over 100 different stakeholders divided over five sectoral groups with uh, independent chairs. There was one group on the build environment the negotiations took 12 months. I have a slide which show the whole process, but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, and then four environmental NGOs joined in the process as well. So about the built environment, interesting is that the chair of that uh, sectoral group was Diederik Samson, and he is now the head of cabinet of um, uh, Vice President Timmermans. So he knows he and he's in charge, uh, Timmermans is in charge of the Green Deal. So this guy is very influential now and he knows everything about the built environment and he's coming from Greenpeace. So it's, it's quite good, I would say. So the target was 3.4 megaton CO2 reduction by 2030. Um, 24 organizations joined and they, were, they agreed that by 2030, 1.5 million houses had to be disconnected from the gas grid, so an alternative heating source. And there would be a multitude of policy instruments, and it would be technology neutral, and solutions would be based on cost per ton of CO2. Uh, and there will be an energy tax based on the uh, CO2 intensity, uh, cost neutrality principle for households and companies, and a key role for municipalities. So, furthermore, they said, and here come the sector, the the social housing sector that owns 30% of the building stock in the Netherlands, they are the, uh, the motor of this process. So this disconnection from the gas grid needs to start with the social housing sector and from there the private, privately owned houses can join. There would also be a neighborhood by neighborhood approach led by municipalities. Uh, there would be subsidies for basically everything. And the increase on the tax on gas and uh, uh, a decrease of the tax on electricity to uh, improve the, the business case for heat electrification, such as Jan talked about, and also to make it well more attractive to get rid of gas for heating. Um, industry would pay more for, uh, for gas and electricity, that's already happening, and there would be special mortgages 
for to make investments more uh, affordable and attractive. And on-build financing, so a loan not connected to a person, but a loan connected to the building, is being developed and will be introduced next year. So those are the main things, but oh, I showed this this morning already. This Not all buildings can be energy neutral, so you need to work on the buildings and on uh, this and, and on the so reducing demand and then decarbonizing the demand. So the different heating options, but Jan already explained them, so I don't need to go in this. Um, and then there is also a whole governance system. The basis of that is the climate law, which uh, set a binding target for 49% CO2 emission reduction by 2050 and an aspirational target for 2030. That's very weak. Um, there's an annual monitoring and reporting to Parliament and the government is to oblige is obliged to fulfill the climate law obligations and has to take additional measures when necessary. Um, that is, but because there is only a target for 2050, the question is how strong is this? And then, most important, is the role of the municipalities. Because the heating is very much a local and a regional issue. By, uh, by the end of 2021, all municipalities have to submit a plan to the government uh, at what moment in time they will disconnect which neighborhood from the gas grid. And for all the neighborhoods they want to disconnect until 2030, they need to come up with the alternative heating source and the alternative heating plan, but also an insulation plan. So uh, there will be subsidy for the first moving neighborhoods. Uh, so they're already, it's already being implemented. There are already neighborhoods being disconnected from the gas grid. And in some it's working well, and in others it's not working. Um, there is a, a lot of support for municipalities, technical support, but also data support. There's um, the National Environmental Assessment Agency is calculating everything for the municipalities, but in the end they have to take the decisions. And there's a lot of learning and sharing. But it's not all, you know. I would say that this process is just irrevocable. We will, the Netherlands will get out of natural gas or fossil gas for heating. The, the question is how fast and what the solutions will be. Uh, I think and climate is one of the reasons, but the main reason is the earthquakes in the north of the Netherlands. Um, that is really, uh, that is such a strong driver. Climate alone wouldn't have been enough of a driver, sadly enough. But there are a few risks that might derail the process. There's a uh, potential loss of public support if things go wrong in these uh, in these neighborhoods that are already being disconnected and they can't heat their house anymore or they have outrageous electricity bills because the dimension of the heat pump and the you know level of insulation isn't good you may it might become a political topic in the elections um, there's a very ri uh, ri big risk and it's already happening a large scale uptake of biomass because that is an easy solution out for district heating, connecting buildings to district heating based on biomass. There's a heavy debate on that currently um, because there's also a realization that it will lead to deforestation. The gas industry is still very powerful and uh, they may convince on the, the green gas, biogas narrative because that would be an easy solution out. Nothing would need to happen, nothing had to change. Um, and the easy, the another is the easiest neighborhoods will be done first, likely. Well, it's not a bad choice, but you might end up with the very difficult ones in the end that you would still have to uh, disconnect from the gas. And it's the social housing corporations that are leading and they, are, they have the knowledge and the will and they can just disconnect 200, 400 houses in one go and do an insulation process, but if it's owner-occupied, it's more difficult. And also affordability and cost of society. Dutch are um, very much on the penny, so uh, affordability and costs is a big thing. So the next, this is, um, I think this is my last slide, yes. So in November 2020, the, uh, there will be the second progress report on the, uh, the climate uh, agreement. And it will also give uh, the data on the Agenda court case. Are we getting to 25% emission reduction or not? 
no one knows what will happen if that's not the case. But we all, uh, we all know that it's not going to happen, but we don't know what will happen afterwards. Um, in 2020, there will be a, this year there will be a proposal for law for on that allows on-build financing, and there will be other proposals on uh, a heat law, a new heat law, and, and something else. In January 2021, as I said, the, uh, the municipalities have to submit the neighborhood by neighborhood plans to disconnect, and in May 2021, we'll have national elections, which the principle will not change, but it might change the, the speed with which things are happening. That's it, thank you. Thank you, René. Uh, maybe I should try to translate the untranslatable. Basically, the saying in Bulgarian is, um, uh, dear daughter, I'll tell you something so that the daughter-in-law can kind of have the, the blinking light and get to, to think about it. Um, we will continue with another presentation. Preminavame kam prezentacija od Enefekt. Инженер Александър Станков, с който се познаваме от много години и с който сме работили по някакви проекта. Um, together on several projects. His presentation will be uh, a continuation of sorts of what we discussed this morning with Петър Хлобел. Because the step-by-step -step, uh, approach which will allow us for further steps and would be cost efficient, uh, inclu includes every possible measure for energy efficiency in households. I should have started here, but that's not so important. I'll begin with why we really need to renovate our homes, although we have discussed that already. Rene already showed the picture I'm about to show. But not only do homes become more comfortable, more cost efficient, and we improve air quality, which are additional pluses. We have another picture uh, which shows that we have very high requirements to new homes, but uh, in 2050, those will be only 25% of existing homes. The remaining 75 need to be renovated, so they have low um, thermal characteristics. and. The only way that's going to happen is through deep renovation, not just changing the energy source to renewables. And we've been working with municipalities for a long time, trying to raise awareness, trying to develop policies, and mostly trying to raise the level of our expertise. Um, on any building, we want to go from the green picture that you just saw to this. If you have a lot of money, you can do it very easily and very fast. You put 20 centimeters of insulation, a new boiler. <coughs> you can even make your building zero energy. But usually, we don't have that money, which means we need to compromise on insulation thickness, on the fuel we use. And that is most easily avoided with the step-by-step -step approach, where at investing the money we currently have will allow us to continue in the future. So the best way is, of course, to put thick insulation on all walls, 
change the windows and do everything else. Here are several step-by-step -step approaches. Of course, we start with a non-insulated building. Uh, one approach is we put in thick insulation. Of course, uh, there's a problem with uh, windows, which we u usually do not talk about because it's difficult to link the new window to uh, prior existing insulation. Then we make it airtight. Uh, then we put in the new heating system from uh, renewable energy. Another approach would be to start with the uh, northern facade, then the south, and then finally put in the heating system. In the third picture, in both cases, um, ventilation windows and air tightness go together. Once we uh, put in new windows, air quality inside the building drops. We get more carbon dioxide inside the building, uh, sometimes two, three, four times above the uh, permissible levels. We find it hard to get up in the morning. We fall asleep if we're in a room with more people. And these are two things that go together, new windows and ventilation. So it could be detached ventilation, separate in each room, but we need to have some ventilation. And finally, the best case scenario is the uh, have the heating uh, system installed after everything else, because that way you can calculate what kind of heating system you need based on the insulation that you already have, and that is more cost efficient and energy efficient. Now, each building is different, so you need to have an expert go there and check the situation on site and give you the best possible advice. In NFX, we've been working for a long time on this, and we've developed this project with many partners throughout Europe. I'm not going to enumerate all of them. And we came up with these two things, which are part of a common platform. On the left, you have the so-called iBroad logbook, I wrote log book. Uh, it's somewhat similar to Facebook in terms of interface. It has the data on the building where the energy auditor can get information and then see the rest of the details on site. And then on the right, you see a road map which is drafted together with the customer. And based on that, you can get an idea of what the energy characteristics you can achieve would be. So we've done 15 of these pilot projects on individual houses. In Bulgaria, I'll show you one example. I think it's pretty interesting. Of course, uh, fortunately here we had uh, m more resources at our disposal and we did more measurements, which I'll show you in a bit. Uh, um, the building was not sufficiently heated. It had no insulation, but they had changed the windows. The new windows were not very good, but they were what the guy could afford. Air quality within the building was good. Uh, was not good because a lot of dust from the street would, uh, would come into the building. Comfort was low because the boiler was insufficient. There was uh, a current of cool air and the interior needed renovation, so there was a lot to do. The customer wanted first to change their boiler because it was insufficient, but we did this uh, <coughs> check and we proved they were wrong. We did an air tightness test, which we usually do not do. 
we actually knew there was a problem in the building. We also knew where it was. So doing the test, first we uh, turned on the ventilator and it uh, produced a 50 pascal difference in pressure. Uh, the first two floors were built in the 1920s, thick walls, uh, very good quality, so there was no problem there. Third floor, which was built in the 90s, the roof construction was uh, wooden beams, um, just uh, with boards on top for the roof tiles and two centimeters of EPS between the beams which in most places didn't even reach the beams. It was uh, uh, fixed with nail with uh, nails. And uh, as we were wa walking up to the third floor, the wind was blowing in our hair. And when we went up, we found that the situation was pretty bad. This is my favorite photo from this house. The result was pretty shocking. 12.5 uh, hours on m minus first is a lot worse than what we would normally consider a well insulated building, which would be two, and a passive building in Germany would be 0 0.6. So it's a huge difference. So the customer's priority was a new boiler. Uh, because they thought it was insufficient for the third floor. Uh, get a patch up the roof. And he said he wanted to do everything in two steps, whereas our conclusion, which we reached together, was first insulate the roof and uh, put in 30 centimeters of insulation there. We calculated that uh, it would be the same as putting 10 centimeters of insulation on the roof and the walls. Then after the roof, they would replace their boiler, but they wouldn't need as big a boiler as they initially thought. Uh, the new boiler would be with pellets instead of wood. Then they would install installation, uh, ventilation in bedrooms, then insulation on the walls, and that would be almost everything. Then sometime in the future, if they wanted to reach a class. That was my example. I hope uh, you understood my message. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. A uh, short technical pause. I just want to remind you that when we started with uh, um, wanting to, uh, desiring prob uh, programs for um, insulation and in e efficient heating, we targeted the poorest in uh, um, energy and social terms people households and we wanted a program that would uh, be groundbreaking in terms of what uh, the politicians are ready to do because whatever measures uh, for renovating which require a family to move out of their household in order to renovate it takes too much effort and uh, very few of our politicians would be uh, likely to take such measures, while implementing a new stove takes just a few hours. We thought that this would not compromise uh, the next steps too much if we can do something in the future additionally for these households uh, with better uh, financial situation because we envisioned to 
uh, have uh, very small installations um, uh, implemented, heating just one room. So even if we improve the energy efficiency of a certain household or a certain room, this would not lead to a uh, risky, huge rescaling of uh, the systems there. But this rule doesn't apply, and we do not support programs that um, don't take into account energy efficiency in terms of whole buildings and whole households. And I, we believe that uh, this year key that in effect uh, is uh, taking should be followed for sure. Our next presentation is by architect uh, Milan Rashevsky from Ines. It's on the screen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now I will talk about a different topic. Uh, we spoke about thermal, thermal pumps, heat pumps, and uh, separate households. Uh, what happens to a big extent in many Western countries, and I hope with a successful transfer of technologies, it will begin to happen in Bulgaria as well. I talk about the uh, central heating sector and uh, its opportunities for decarbonization of heating on a large scale. First, a uh, few words about our institute. We are a non-profit organization. We've been active for eight years, but most people in our team have had uh, between 15 and 30, 40 uh, years of professional experience as architects, engineers, physicists, uh, and um, etc. We um, do apply science, and we strive. Uh, uh, we are trying everything that we do to be um, beneficial for society and to find appli its applications in um, on, mar on the market. We've had uh, quite successful projects uh, in Bulgaria and abroad. Some things are hard to be implemented on the Balkans, while in other countries they are recognized. We've partnered with Qatar. We've had two projects there. Last <clears throat> fall, we have discovered the first in Bulgaria and six in the world building with um, water um, window panes that absorb solar energy into the facade of the building. Quite an interesting topic. I will not go into detail today, but you can. You are free to ask me about it. We've had a lot of. Uh, we've done a lot of research on um, well, city, urban level, how we can do the energy um, transition to more efficient heating. Specifically about this technology, the first installation for uh, solar heating um, was in Sweden. Uh, in Denmark, it was quite popular as well, in countries which do not have a lot of solar light, but the people's mentality is different. They have opportunities for community cooperatives. Uh, they could get obtain loans from banks. So this story starts with a community on a Danish island. And the people decided, instead of having gas or other fossil fuel heating, to invest their money into renewable energy. This installation that I'm showing to you uh, s services a town of uh, 60,000 people, same size as uh, Vratza and Sliven. They have central heating there. Uh, the, in the installation has large solar spaces 
which can be centrally located, but can could also be decentralized on uh, the roofs of the separate buildings. Uh, they made use of industrial space. There are different options for putting these solar solar panels. I'm I want to say that these are uh, hot water collectors, not photovoltaics. And uh, usually there's a huge reservoir. That's uh, usually the second step when the percentage of uh, solar heating is above the capacity of the heating system. This always happens because people do appreciate the effect. And uh, we have such a reservoir, which is a seasonal accumulator of energy, a, a very big underground artificial lake covered with um, insulation, where uh, they store hot water from the summer to the winter season. I often uh, compare it to um, putting sunlight into jars, but this jar is quite big. This is how an installation like this looks. We went to an installation um, made in 19, 1994. Uh, it's, the wear and tear is very low. They're very high quality panels. Their um, life is 50 plus years. The maintenance is um, minimal. Once a year, a person um, monitors um, on site uh, if there are any problems. These type, uh, this type of collectors are not the usual collectors which we are accustomed to seeing on rooftops. These are collectors for industrial uh, production of hot water. They are quite big between 12 and 30 square meters is uh, the surface of one of these collectors. This is the biggest installation. This is how a pump station looks, a typical one. In this case, our Danish colleagues have covered their installation with uh, photovoltaic panels, which uh, provides the electricity for the pump installation. And it's almost entirely um, um, clean energy, renewable energy. This is the installation um, during construction because it was filled with water and hydro isolated. After they fill, fill it with water, they put a floating um, thermal insulation. There is no roof. Uh, construction. These are panels of thermal insulation, and there's a special rain uh, drain draining system. The largest installation uh, plant. The project is um, on the way right now. It's called Big Solar Guts. I, it's in Austria, so it's an installation with. Uh, half a million uh, square meters of uh, collector field and could provide 20% of uh, the whole heating. Also, the installation uh, plans a buffer, which according to the last data, one, it was 1.8 million, which is quite a big of a lake. The installation will be connected to the existing uh, heating system and uh, it would go to the city. And also there is a th uh, thermal installation to regulate the temperature. This is quite an ambitious project and we are all um, keeping our fingers crossed so that it happens. I don't like um, giving presentations speaking only of about things that take place in the far away lands. We've had quite a successful practice in Bulgaria um, while transferring this technology. It was quite it became quite popular. We 
there was a private investor uh, who financed this project with uh, contracts, 13 hospitals in Bulgaria, and uh, they had implemented uh, 30,000. Um, in Pumogia, there was um, the largest collect collector, 1,300 square meters. And uh, it was used for uh, f uh, physiotherapy of uh, sick people. The building was um, built with private capital, which shows that this uh, technology could be economically effective, cost effective. Also, a smart grid was uh, constructed, which controlled all energy source uh, of fl of flows at every single moment. And uh, the monitoring for each ESCO contract was quite um, important because it was clear what happens where. These panels, in this case, are Macedonian panels, but we also have Bulgarian produ uh, producers of panels. I don't think there are a lot of people from the government or the private sector here, but it's good to think that such projects open up a lot of um, new jobs and stimulate green economy. And the capital of Bulgarians remain in Bulgaria instead of being exported for fossil fuels, which is the current practice. We um, also have perfected the technologies because our um, NGO does not only strive to um, uh, implement this technology, but also to improve it. And uh, we had this project of such uh, cells that could be um, in, uh, implemented in uh, spaces between um, blocks. And the collectors are installed directly on the thermal insulation of the reservoir, there are no losses, and uh, you get the surface underneath heated. This type of insulation is connected to a pump station and um, also connected to the heating uh, network. This is how this type of insulation might look. Now I'll tell you in short about a few projects that we um, hope we'll find understanding and something will happen uh, with them. There is a serious investment um, movement in terms of um, real estate in the uh, Hladionica neighborhood in Sofia, close to so the Sofia Zoo. In this zone, uh, a number of investment projects are planned. The, it, you can see it's quite um, appealing. It's uh, relatively well connected to the city center, close to big uh, parks. The closest uh, central heating, according to the urban planning of Sofia, is uh, the power plant, plant of uh, uh, Istuk, even though the central power plant is not very far either. And within uh, this analysis, you can see there are 10 large investment projects marked by the chief um, architect of Sofia. And their total surface is 650,000 square meters. It's literally a new neighborhood for Sofia. The idea is to, for this new neighborhood to be heated in a more intelligent way. So the water comes in a low temperature uh, heating um, network. And each building, uh, no matter whether it's a residential or business, there are th um, pumps, heat pumps, 
and uh, we and also could they could also have different renewable energy sources the big potential of a low temperature heating is that it allows for including many and different types in terms of temperature and potential energy sources uh, we should not uh, slight this the idea is to have uh, water circulate in this uh, network uh, with a temperature of 20 25 um, degrees also the same uh, network could be used for um, heating and uh, because the pump could uh, increase or lower the heat balance so um, it could be used both for cooling and heating heal, heating and cooling so we have water running 20 25 degrees and uh, the network will not be expensive because there it will not require serious uh, pipe insulation and there will be fewer losses in this uh, system so it's uh, quite an interesting framework uh, so you can have uh, geothermal also energy from sewage which is not to be dismissed sewage has uh, a temperature few degrees higher than uh, the earth and there is um, permanent um, flow of sewage water and um, I've witnessed projects in Austria and Switzerland like this but why not try implement it here here the situation of this project the different points of access for each building and uh, at the end of my presentation a look into the future because everything that I have uh, spoken about it depends on the state of technology one year ago I participated in a forum for uh, solar heating in Graz the fifth annual world um, conference on solar uh, heating and we've had uh, the honor even though we were the only representative of Bulga from Bulgaria it, uh, to receive the first prize for the best idea in this field it was about collectors in existing water basins with floating thermal um, insulation anchored to the bottom which could produce and store energy at the same time and be much cheaper to build than what uh, we are used to building on land and uh, on land they require a lot of digging uh, of course this is just a, theor a theoretical project but uh, there's a lot of work uh, required but we do have uh, interest um, even in Bulgaria by a huge uh, logistics center close to the to Pancerevo lake they're interested in such way of heating who knows we man we've managed to build the first um, building with solar window panes so we could be might be successful in this with this project as well thank you for your attention um, if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you. I'm very sorry we weren't able to organize the presentation by our colleagues from Slovakia who were going to tell us about their plans for central heating through G deep geothermal uh, uh, they are currently uh, organizing public discussions, so hopefully on, they will participate in our next forum. I wanted to ask Petter to tell us a few words about that project, but I'm not, because 
We're running short on time. We're going to have another presentation by Hannah from Environmental Action Germany, who is going to tell us about a few trends that have to do with heating with firewood. So again, issues that have to do with individual heating, individual installations, and the perspectives in, in Germany, because it seems that biomass is not about to disappear and we need to use it in the most efficient possible way. <clears throat> You know, you know me now, so I don't need to say anything. I hope. Um, uh, at the f at first, I just want to um, say a li uh, little bit. Yeah, our work is, uh, as I said before, mainly focusing on the small uh, stoves and appliances, and. Um, yeah, we always uh, face the problem that the uh, actual impact of wood burning is not visible at the first sight. Um, uh, that is because um, yeah, the air quality directive and so on. There's always uh, they're always speaking about PM10, and uh, especially for wood burning. Most of the particles are really ultra fine particles, which, mean, which means it's PM0.1. Um, this yeah, is uh, the nice uh, graphic about uh, how, how small it is <laughs> uh, compared to human hair. And um, as I uh, already said that um, at the moment everywhere only particle mass is uh, measured in the type approval and uh, in the and eco design and all limit values um, on domestic heating or biomass uh, burning layer on uh, uh, particle mass. Um, and uh, it's kind of hidden also because most of the uh, monitoring stations are uh, traffic uh, on traffic related um, situations and there are only few monitoring stations in residential areas where of course um, the impact of the heating system is uh, yeah, more visible. And yeah, that's why uh, because uh, it's still that the focus is a lot on uh, the emissions of, of transport. Um, yeah, I want to show some graphics. Uh, how do the emissions from if you if we look at PM 2.5 here, um, how uh, small scale combustion uh, versus traffic. If you have, uh, I try to explain. This is the uh, fine dust emissions from uh, the exhaust of traffic. So, uh, without um, the the dust from the from the tires and so on, only the the exhaust, which is um, going down, because many uh, or most cars are supposed to have filters, and so on. Yeah. Annual German metrics, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, from the um, Federal Environmental uh, Authority. Um, and I mean, the, these, the, it's always a bit behind, but yeah, it's the most. And uh, the, the green ones are the, um, is a, the combustion, mainly of wood. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is only wood. The, the small dots, but yeah, it's really if you have a look, it's quite. It's not. You can't say it's all coming from tr from transport, obviously. And um, they are um, these small stoves in Germany are, yeah, I think quite. Uh, it's not changing so much. There are about 11 million of appliances. Um, and the next one is uh, where do, in the small scale combustion, where does the uh, which fuel does uh, contribute to the emissions and the green one is wood. The um, pink one is uh, coal. We were talking about it at breakfast already, <laughs> that there's still a, a remaining uh, um, quantity of emissions of, um, of coal in the private households, which is really not, yeah, it is still allowed, um, but 
not really necessary actually to for for Germany, but as it's still allowed, it's not uh, shut down completely. Um, yeah, and most of it uh, results from wood. Um, yeah, another EU project. I just want to say what what we were doing for the last yeah almost five years now. Um, it's uh, we had the uh, EU Live project Clean Heat, and. Uh, yeah, the, the overall uh, objective is obviously the um, to cut down emissions from, from wood burning, especially the small stoves. And uh, we were, had a project partner from Denmark, and we were, uh, had cooperations with, with many NGOs from uh, many different countries, many Eastern European countries, um, like Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, in Bulgaria, we are <laughs> working in the last month with uh, Satsang Yata as well. Um, outside you can see the um, exhibition, they translated and um, yeah, there you can have a uh, look at it. And uh, the uh, project officially ended end of last year. Yeah, but of course we still uh, work on the topic and uh, yeah, the the goals are, uh, of this project were mainly to raise awareness um, uh, in the public for the emissions, that there are emissions from wood burning, that it's not a clean solution, that it's not necessarily um, climate neutral, all this, and uh, to generate public uh, support that they are okay with more ambitious legislation. Um, of course, contribute expertise to the political debate on the um, uh, on local level and EU level, and uh, the transfer of knowledge. Someone already mentioned it is always very very important uh, in EU projects, and uh, this is why we had cooperations with so many other um, countries. Um, this uh, oh, wait, <laughs> this is a house. Um, it's, uh, I, d I took the picture, I was um, visiting uh, friends of mine who were um, um, moved out of the city, so um, that's what happens, then you end up uh, with neighbors like this, <laughs> because you want, don't want to live in the city anymore, say, oh, the air quality is so poor, and then, uh, yeah, your neighbor is heating all the time like this, really nice. And um, yeah, what um, our instruments to address the pu public, uh, as I said, were um, pu different publications, leaflets. Um, this leaflet is also available in uh, Bulgarian, <laughs> thanks to Zaltsam uh, And um, especially in Germany, we um, contributed, uh, we, we disseminated these leaflets together with uh, DIY markets who sell a lot of stoves in Germany. And uh, with the chimney sweeps, uh, they took it to the um, people directly when they visited them. As I uh, told in the morning that they are regular visits and they are uh, do a kind of training on site, <laughs> and of course, it's not always the uh, main operator of this uh, stove, which is uh, there at the moment when the chimney sweep is there. So they are really happy to have a leaflet to leave there, and where the people can have a look uh, how to operate it. Um, we had this uh, mobile exhibition you see outside in Germany. We um, it was shown in uh, more than 25 um, municipalities. And uh, yeah, recently we had this translation in uh, Bulgarian and in uh, Hungarian as well. So um, yeah, um, we have a short film. Uh, I don't know if we want to show it later on, but we could. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it was really uh, successful. I think for, it's from our organization, it was uh, kind of the most successful animated uh, short film. Um, even though it lasts, I think, over one minute, and I learned from our communication team that nowadays films are only allowed to have 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds or something, <laughs> otherwise the people don't uh, look until the end, but this one uh, was really good. Yeah, we have a website uh, where all, yeah, everything, you can uh, read everything on the project. And we did some uh, measurements to make the pollution visible with this uh, P-Track counter. It, count, uh, it is a count, uh, counts um, particle numbers of ultrafine particles. And um, it's 
Yeah, it is mainly we we did these uh, ambient air measurements uh, mainly for 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 the press so that we uh, can show to the media. Hey, here we we smell something and you see that the numbers going up, up something like that. You can't use it for a legal case or something, but just to um, illustrate the the pollution. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, as I said, press work and social media. Um, yeah, one of the I think one of the main successes or products of this uh, project is um, the uh, Blue Angel label. It's uh, um, we we kind of um, started it uh, said uh, that we need this eco label. The Blue Angel is the uh, voluntary independent, independent eco label, the most. Um, um, uh, the most known in, in Germany. It's um, uh, 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 you can apply for it at the at the German Ministry and Federal. Uh, so it's really a, an official label, and uh, we um, have now a, a label for for firewood stoves uh, in place since January. The the manufacturers are able to to apply for it. No one did until now, but we really, really hope that in a few weeks we will have the first stoves available on the market. Um, uh, to, get, to get this label, um, there's included a, a much more realistic test cycle, and uh, it is necessary to, uh, to also measure um, particle number. There's not a limit value yet for particle number. Uh, but you have to measure it, and of course, uh, the goal in the future is uh, also to have a limit value for um, particle number, and not only for uh, particle uh, mass. And um, to the realistic test cycle is mainly based on the um, on a project from the technology technology research center in the south of Germany, um, and the project is called Be Real Project. You can have a look if you are interested. I think you will find it uh, under Be Real Project. Um, and yeah, there are really ambitious emission limit values, which can only, at the moment at least, um, be reached uh, with a filter or participator. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, the last uh, point that uh, within this label, um, the stove and the participator, oh, this word is really hard, <laughs> sorry, uh, if they are, s they are sold and installed um, together. And uh, it is, uh, uh, there's a reduced potential for operating errors um, for the small stoves. Uh, yeah, it's really, um, most or a lot of emissions are uh, caused by, by operating uh, errors. So there's a, a automatic combustion air control and uh, monitoring of the burning process included. Yeah. Well, what is it? He just uh, wanted to ask a question. How is it? No, <laughs> Do you okay? Well, this is the last presentation. So, <laughs> so I you can, can take any yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's, al it it's almost so it's charged. almost the last slide. No. So. Uh, yeah. Are you, do you have a for the for the label or let's so finish we the yeah let's finish. And okay please good. remember your questions yeah another uh, kind of best practice example more for uh, it's a pellet boiler uh, of a local ice cream manufacturer uh, which is uh, situated near Berlin called Florida Ice they re retrofitted their existing um, pellet boiler and we did some measurements um, this is the filter. And uh, yeah, and you can clearly see uh, that this is uh, without the filter, and if you switch it on, um, the the emissions go down up to 85 percent, even it's 80 percent. But um, and uh, this is really uh, the w the way to go, we think. Um, uh, it's particle number. It's, it's. I think they. Me it's measuring uh, ultra fine particles, even uh, zero point one. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Our conclusions, or yeah, what we are working at uh, still is that heating with wood can 
contribute to the tra transition to renewables, but we al always have to keep in mind uh, the air quality aspects. And uh, uh, it's the status and technologies which are used at the moment, it's really not really an option. So there has, uh, has to happen something. Um, there really needs to be in place a significant reduction of ultrafine particles and black carbon. And uh, this can be reached partly uh, if there are uh, emission reduction measures st uh, really uh, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, that they are g uh, going to be a standard procedure <laughs> on every stove. Um, as I said before, at the moment the limit values allow um, that uh, it's still uh, possible for the stove to reach these uh, values without any um, exhaust, gas, extra exhaust gas cleaning. And um, this, of course, um, led to the, had the effect that there are solutions, but they are not on the market or not widely spread on the market because no one really needs them. And so they are quite expensive, of course, still. And if uh, there is mass production and so on, of course, it will be uh, cheaper. And uh, yeah, and from our side, the, the best practices are, for example, the Blue Angel and uh, a retrofitted Retrofitting project like with Florida eyes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah, for a second time today. And questions, because then we need to have a coffee break. I'm sure that everyone wants a bit of rest. Are there any questions in the room? I think there was something indicated. No? Everybody wants coffee? Okay, it's not like everyone wants to hear. All right. <laughs> um, I said, do we have anything over Skype uh, that has arrived? No. 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 Uh, here. No, there is no questions over Skype, but, but um, I'm really interesting. Uh, how expensive is uh, this type of uh, equipment, electro? Mm, the, the very hard name for pronunciation. The precipitator. Precipitator, yeah. yes. <laughs> the buzzword today. <laughs> okay. um, I think uh, the the kind of the, the newest for, one are for not. houses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not on the on the market yet. The newest ones, uh, but at the moment the solutions are about two three thousand euro, I think, and the bigger one for the boiler is even higher. Uh, so, um, I don't know what it costs actually, but um, yeah, it's even more expensive. Uh, what part of mm. Britain does it make it so expensive? Mm. We need the translation first. Sorry, I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. I want her to say yeah. anti precipitate once again. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's just because it's not mass produced. They just have so, so small numbers. Uh, I mean, for cars, it's uh, standard. And so uh, at, at first, they were all complaining, uh, oh, it's so costly. It was kind of exactly the same situation and the same discussion. So <laughs> I don't say it again. <laughs> uh. A, a comment rather than a question, but uh, we've been opposing here pretty much, um, and we consider it like putting the horse in front of the cart, because um, there were intentions in the in some municipalities in Bulgaria that they're going to install filters without working at all on the fuel base of the of the households, just putting filters, um, electro electrostatic filters on uh, chimneys. Um, and they were going to cost about uh, 2,000 euro each, while the solutions for energy poverty that we were initially proposing were at the threshold of 1,000 euro per household. So we could work on the energy efficiency of two households for the price of one filter, and it was really a perverse incentive for us. But it probably does make sense for upgraded already solutions, the ones that you show. I have a question and then send back to you. Um, 
is biomass going to stay? Because um, from many, uh, from the few um, debates that we had over Skype in the previous weeks, I had the impression that biomass in Germany is going to remain at least as a plan B, as a, as a backup option for many households, even the ones that upgrade and go towards modern electric solutions like heat pumps. Um, what is the tendency there? Is yeah. it going to stay around? Um. Yes, um, it's a bit um, difficult um, because, of course, there are people who say uh, you don't need this technology, at least in Germany it's mainly secondary heating, you can just ban everything. But, of course, if you say uh, just ban it, it's always difficult to communicate. So we say it's, you have, um, there is technology to make it consider considerably cleaner and it just needs to get to, uh, to the market. And then, of course, um, you have to keep in mind um, that uh, we heard about the Renewable Energy Directive and all this stuff. If you um, want to change the complete heating system, many people are looking, oh, here we have biomass, we have wood, which is uh, a great <laughs> and easy thing to um, get into the households. And there we say, of course, uh, we have really have to have a close look that the air quality is not going to be worse. Um, if you put it into, um, and of course you have to see how much wood is there that could be burned, uh, or should you maybe use the wood for to build the house or something like that. And um, yeah, because if you um, burn it, um, even if you uh, burn it completely, so there is no soot or something or black carbon, um, it's always better, of course, to keep it as a carbon sink and not burn it and release it, and then it has to grow, and you don't know how, f how quick it grows. It, it doesn't grow as quick as you burn it, definitely. Um, yeah, so um, it can be really a bit part of the solution, but not very wi widespread. And w I think we had some um, and presentations here, um, where is it included in the water um, system and um, just operating for a few days and something like that just to, um, as a backup, a backup option, but uh, most of the energy needs to come somewhere else, yeah, so. I have uh, one comment, but it's not about your presentation. <laughs> uh, I think now it's the space for questions. Space. Yes. It's about the first presentation, so it would not be a question. It would be a comment, because uh, Jan is, we cannot ask the, him, I guess, yes. So he was um, intensively discussing. Ah, OK, sorry. Could you just move uh, in the front so we can see you uh, on the camera? Thing about the night tariff, uh, promoting the heat pumps. I'm also a big fan of the heat pumps and considering installing one in my own home. Uh, but uh, the problem with uh, the he uh, heating with heat pumps and using the night tariff is that uh, in the night, the temperatures are considerably lower uh, especially in the continental climate, like uh, the climate in the Balkans. Uh, in Western Europe, uh, the climate is moderate, so there is no big difference between the day and night temperatures. But in Bulgaria, and probably also in Serbia, uh, there, mm, if it's uh, about minus two, minus three degrees during the day, it can become minus 18 during the night and the coefficient of performance of the heat pumps is considerably lower when the temperature drops down. So this compensates the night tariffs. This is just one point to consider. And when we use heat pumps for cooling, uh, there is undoubtedly, undoubtedly very high effect in using the night tariff of the heat pump because uh, we can cool down the building during the night when the coefficient of performance is very high and also use the night tariff. So there is a, a double effect of uh, using the heat pumps in the night for cooling, but I'm a more skeptical about uh, using the heat pumps uh, in the for heating in the night time. Okay. That's only when you have air-to-air -air heat pump. Oh. Exactly. Yes. If it's, uh, air heat if it's air to air heat pump, otherwise the geothermal one air to air to wouldn't be. Air to water, 
Well, it depends on the peak prices. Зависи от цените, пиковите цени. Защото пиковите цени може да са 200 пъти по-високи, отколкото пазарът. Докато в, Гър... в Германия има много часове през а, годината, когато цените са отрицателни. Знаете ли колко... А, из... During the night, do you have any idea? I don't. But um, how low? What is the uh, coefficient of performance at minus 15 during the night in Bulgaria on of a typical equipment? I don't know. So uh, we have uh, still we have for the households a regulated market, so we don't have the liberalized uh, energy price. So unfortunately, <laughs> the difference is not so big. Uh, We hope, yes, we expect that this will change in the next five years. Uh, uh, the coefficient of performance uh, for air sourced heat pumps, this means air to water or air to air, uh, which are the normal air conditioners, uh, the air sourced heat pumps can drop from, let's say, about four to about two or less than two. It can become 1.7 and or, or less, so it's a little bit tricky. And uh, the not very high quality uh, air source heat pumps can, they can stop operating. Thank you. And um, the question from Skype, but I'm afraid that it's a, it's a question that we won't be able to answer because there are no institutions, no one from, but I'm going to uh, mention it. Uh, from Mr. Dian Stoichev, there is a question uh, whether um, a lower uh, VAT, lower value added tax, is considered for certain type of eco fuels like pellets. Is there any practice, for example, from Germany or any example from somewhere in Europe that we can mention? Italy has a, a diverse VAT. Okay. And Serbia, you have. Lower rate in Serbia. How lower? Do you have any idea? It's ten. It's ten percent, I think, for pellet. Uh, uh, it's twenty for the regular. Okay. Well. Ta da! Tax policies in action. Thank you. Uh, as well. Um, coffee break. Um, again, sanitize hands. Have some coffee. I would also ask.